Tonight's special guest is Rick Beyer, a New York Times bestselling author, award-winning documentary producer, and a longtime history enthusiast. Our discussion will be moderated this evening by ASOM curator, Jimmy Hallis. We will have about 15 minutes at the conclusion of the discussion to conduct a Q&A. If you have any questions for Rick Beyer, please use the chat box located on your screen. Thank you for reserving your, your spot for tonight and thank you very much for attending and I'll turn it over to Jimmy. Thanks Renee. So good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to the U.S. Army Airborne and Special Operations Museum uh, author series. Uh, we're glad everybody could to, to attend. Like uh, Renee said, my name is Jimmy Hallis. I'm the curator here at the U.S. Army Airborne and Special Operations Museum. Uh, located in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, we also have with us Abby Cashel, who's uh, part of the museum's nonprofit. She's going to be assisting with uh, questions from our social media sites and, and from here. Um, so as Renee mentioned, we have uh, Mr. Rick Baer, uh, historian, author, award-winning filmmaker, and speaker. Um, many of his documentary, documentaries, excuse me, I can't speak tonight have aired on the History Channel, National Geographic, A&E, and the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, Rick wrote and directed the documentary film, The Ghost Army, which actually premiered on PBS in 2013. And it can also be found online if you're interested in seeing that. Um, but tonight we're gonna be discussing his book, The Ghost Army of World War II, How One Top Secret Unit Deceived the Army with Inflatable Tanks, Sound Effects, and audacious, other audacious fakery. Uh, and one other note here, to complement the book, Mr. Uh, Bear has a traveling exhibit on the Ghost Army, which is currently here on display at the Airborne Special Operations Museum. Uh, it'll be here till the 25th of April. Uh, if you're in town or happen to be passing by, please come by and stop and check it out. It's a really neat, super informative uh, exhibit. Um, we're open Tuesday through Friday right now, 10 to 4.30. Uh, we do have plans to open up on 10 April, which is a Saturday. So Saturdays will be 10 to 4.30 also. Admission is free. Uh, so please come by, swing in, check out the exhibit, maybe grab, grab you some Ghost Army gear and uh, a copy of the book, which I promise you won't put it down once you start it. It is a great book. Um, I'm not going to disagree with you. Oh, good, good, no, good. I'm not going to argue about that. And if you can't get to the museum, uh, don't be afraid to visit our website, asomf.org, and you can order online. They'll ship it anywhere in the world you want. So, Rick, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, it's great to be here and, uh, and have a chance to talk to you guys about the Ghost Army. And I know that um, I'm sure some of the people who are who are with us today have had a chance to to see the exhibit and maybe some people have had a chance to look at the book, but um, Jimmy, you know, I thought it might be a good idea uh, just for anybody who's coming to this and maybe doesn't know exactly what we're talking about to kind of ground people that we could play them a, a little short video that gives you the idea of what the ghost army was all about and what they did. What do you think about that? Let's roll. Let's do all it. Right. All right. There's no sound. Can you hear it now? Okay. No. We need to be in show business where we set up. Um, yeah. Okay. I think I think it's it's okay. Go ahead. Is it okay? We'll find out. Night stands and light ghosts disappear. And the mission was to try to be able to take a thousand men and put them in so that 15,000 men could move somewhere else and not be detected. We were told we couldn't tell our wives or anybody about what we did. It was totally secret. It's amazing the fakery that we were able to perpetrate upon the enemy. Thank you. 
It was a little bundle of stuff, all compressed before. You opened the bundle, spread the nozzles around, and inflated it. The artillery piece was good, but that M4 tank, that was the beauty. That was a piece of work. Back of my half-track, I tell my children, was the biggest boombox you ever saw. But it played sounds of tanks and activity. They had recordings of building a pontoon bridge or any type of bridge, and you could hear them hammering away and swearing. And... We returned loose in town. Go to the pub, order some omelets, and talk loose. You mean we're asking for the enemy to fire on us? The answer was yes. At that point, we all came to the conclusion that this was a suicide outfit. And a shell landed in front of us, and then a shell flew over our heads and hit the truck behind us. People probably no more than 20, 30 feet away from me that lost limbs because of shrapnel just falling all over. If you're in the wrong place, you can be dead. If you're in the right place, you can live to be as old as I am. You go up against the best army there is and the best group of soldiers, and you can dupe them successfully, Pat yourself on the back. There are German records that show that some of the deceptions were taken, hook, line, and sinker. The 23rd did not win the war single-handedly, but I think it would have cost a lot more American casualties had they not been there. You know you saved lives. You don't know how many you saved, but you know you saved them. They estimated that we saved between 15 and 30,000 lives with our maneuvers. But you know, even if we don't want to save 15 or 30, it was worth it. One mother or one new bride was spared the agony of putting a gold star in their front window. That's what the 23rd headquarters was all about. So, you know, looking at that, Jimmy, I'm reminded of that. That's a, sort of the basis of that was a trailer for the documentary film that I made for PBS. And I interviewed, um, I think, 20 veterans of the unit, um, and only two of them are still alive. And they actually are both in that video, uh, Gil Seltzer and, and the last gentleman, Stanley Nance. And they are both over 100 now. Gil is 106, and Stanley is 100 and two, I think, or three, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, there's only 11 soldiers left out of the 1100 who served in this unit. So I, it's kind of sad to sort of see that progression as we go along. Um, yeah, so so I, I, I don't have a full blown presentation, but I kind of have a short mini presentation to give you guys before we get into doing Q and A, because there's a few uh, sort of pictures that I wanted to share and a few stories I wanted to share with it. And you can advance to that first uh, picture if you want. Um, so the unit, uh, the, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, obviously they're carrying out deception on the battlefield to fool the Germans. Uh, the idea being that if the Germans think we're coming from over here, they're gonna be ready that way. And then if we really come from over here, you know, we get the advantage of surprise. And this is a photograph from their last mission. You can actually see the, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see it's scratched into the negative there that it says it's taking place in Anrath Dulkin, which are two towns in Germany along the Rhine River. And this is from an operation called Operation Viersen, which was to fool the Germans about where the Ninth Army uh, would cross the Rhine River uh, in March 1945. And the thing about this photo that is cool is that every single vehicle in this photo is inflated. And um, I just think, and this is, you know, this is a lot closer 
than we're ever going to let German aerial reconnaissance get, right? They're going to be lucky if they can get a picture from five times the altitude flying quickly. Um, but it still looks pretty realistic. And one of the things when I show this to audiences and I say, you know, here's a little lesson about deception. What is it that makes it look so realistic? So Jimmy, I'll ask you, what is it that makes it look so realistic? Well, I think it's the natural colors, but what really sets it off are, are the tracks. The, 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 the tracks, right. The vehicles, the vehicles have movement. And sometimes when you're in an exhibit, and this is what they're, what these guys were staging, I think, is um, motion, movement. Um, certainly, they knew the German reconnaissance aircraft were coming over. Um, but to be able to, 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 to take the truck that probably hauled all this stuff, right? and drive it around and then inflate it in, in place, the, the pieces. Um, it's just, just part of the artistry. It is. It's part of the artistry. And what they actually did, it didn't just have a truck, they had three bulldozers and they had a combat engineering company and they are putting in the tank tracks at the same time that the guys are setting up the tanks. So, and it's all happening in the dark, right? So it's like, you have to paint a, a 3D painting in the dark and that is the kind of attention to detail that deception requires. Because if you have a tank that's sitting out there, just one of those tanks, and it doesn't have tank tracks to it, then a, a very observant uh, a German, you know, uh, interpreter of reconnaissance photos is going to say, well, wait a minute. And once they figure out one is fake, then they could think they were all fake. And then suddenly you have a problem on your hands. So it's right. a real illustration of how careful you have to be when you're when you're using any kind of deception but particularly i i would say in this case the um the uh inflatables and and one other thing you know so this is just one type of deception and we saw in the video you've got the inflatables you've got the sound deception you've got the kind of uh radio deception and this sort of impersonation that they called special effects where they're wearing the shoulder patches of a unit and driving trucks through town with the bumper markings of that unit but they all depend on having a good story underneath right and i think this is the thing that's easy to miss that the first step in the deception is to come up with the story that you're trying to convince the enemy of that you think will then make them take the actions you want them to take so you're trying to manipulate them. So you need that story. And if you've got a good story, then you can have each kind of deception that you do um, offer a fragment of that story. And then you're putting out, you're not trying to overload them with information. You're trying to give them just enough that, um, that they think they're putting it together themselves, right? That they right. think that they're the detectives taking the clues and putting together the story. Because, um, and we were talking about this before, I was talking to a magician about this and he said, yes, what you need to know is that the lies we tell ourselves are the strongest lies of all, right? So if yes. we can get the German interpreter and you know, intelligence people to tell themselves the lie, well, then they're going to believe it more than if we just lay it all out there for them. So I, I think that's kind of cool. So was I mean, a quick question on the, on the photograph. So is this a, um, uh, a U.S. reconnaissance photo or? Absolutely. This is a, a one of those little, uh, what is it? An L3, uh, single engine Cessna type airplane. So yeah. when they would set stuff up like this, they would then fly over, uh, when it was safe to do so and take a look at their own work to see how they did, you know, because how else do you know if you've really got it, if it really looks real and realistic. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, that's exactly what it is. Of course, the flip side of that is that, you know, every, every um, infantry and armored division had a couple of uh, these single engine planes for, yeah. for reconnaissance. So the ghost army also had inflatable ones. <laughs> so they, yes, could, yeah. they could set up phony runways with inflatable planes on them so that the enemy again another clue to the enemy when you're paying attention to detail like that right um if we can go to the next um image uh something that i think is really cool jimmy a lot of people think that these these inflatable tanks they think of like the macy's balloons and they think it's a giant balloon and they yeah. wonder you know what happens if a piece of shrapnel or something hits it is it gonna go <laughs> like that which would not be really good right fly off into the air 
Yeah. yeah. So so this is uh, this is gives you a kind of a, a little bit of a look inside one kind of dummy. Uh, they're built on a skeleton of inflatable tubes. And this is actually uh, a demo like a test model that has the wider tubes in here. These look like 12 inch tubes. So they ended up doing a lot of stuff with four inch and six inch tubes. Um, but there's inflatable tubes and then you have multiple uh, inflation points and, and segmentation so that um, if shrapnel hits one part of it, it may, you know, it may cave in a little on that side or it might be a small index, but it's not going to blow up the whole thing. So right. and in fact, it, it's equally possible that something coming your way might just go right through and not hit anything. Uh, and so um, so that's kind of an example of what the inside of, of those inflatables look like. So um, they carried uh, repair repair kits to oh yeah oh yeah that would happen and they had rubber patch kits they also used chewing gum uh in emergencies uh and they tell me and patched it on there and wow. and uh, of course um every single guy i interviewed in this unit made a some you know talking about tanks and tank barrels deflating made a viagra joke someplace in uh, interviewing <laughs> them so but they didn't have any viagra with them and it wouldn't have done any good so um, but that's so, so I don't want to overstate visual deception because it's just one kind, but it is so yes. interesting to look at and, and for people to see. So I get asked all the time, um, who thought of this unit and, and I'm going to save you the trouble of asking me, so who dreamed up the idea? Cause it's kind of a great story. And I want you to meet the guys and they're there in the next slide because, okay. um, the people who created this, uh, dreamed this up are two officers, two U S army, uh, intelligence officers, uh, major Ralph Ingersoll and Colonel Billy Harris and Jimmy, they are complete opposites. Okay. So Ralph Ingersoll on the left, he's, uh, he was a civilian before the war. He's a celebrity author journalist publisher he's kind of flamboyant he's interviewed you know churchill and stalin and roosevelt he thinks a whole lot of himself um and uh he's very left-wing um and um and uh and he also has a reputation for being kind of um a liar for being somebody who doesn't do a very good job of telling the truth all the time uh i guess fake news right um but he <laughs> is um he is, has this reputation uh, uh, but he's also um really super bright he's he's uh, and one of the guys who worked with him said i never met such a bright guy who was such a gd liar Okay, so that's Ralph Ingersoll, and he's working in 1943 in the Special Plans branch of the uh, of the ETO in London with Colonel Billy Harris. Billy is his boss, and Billy Harris is a super button-down uh, West Point grad. His father was a general. His brother was a general. Billy became a general um, uh, uh, later, you know, in the late 50s. Um, Billy Harris commanded the Seventh Cavalry in Korea. I always say he did a heck of a lot better job than Custer did when he commanded the Seventh Cavalry, since they weren't all killed. But so these are like two completely different people. And if you think about um, how maybe uh, under normal circumstances, they might never have even had a cup of coffee together. And you could imagine them sort of not even getting along. But in fact, they were a really good creative partnership. And um, they were looking, they were working uh, in trying to come up with means to assist uh, the invasion force that they knew was going to be going the following spring into Normandy. Uh, they had observed what the British were doing with deception, tactical deception in North Africa, strategic deception uh, with Operation Fortitude, and they came up with the idea for this mobile multimedia tactical deception unit, and then they sold it to the brass. And Ingersoll was the kind of the pie in the sky, here's my brilliant idea, here's what we should do guy, and yeah. Billy Harris was kind of the yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Here's how it's actually going to work. And here's how we're going to make it work inside the army hierarchy guy. And together, they made it happen. And I think it's a great example of the power of working with somebody who thinks differently than you, right? And that kind of yeah. collaboration. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. And you, and like you said, you can kind of look at it, you know, you got Ralph there, he's, He's smiling and jiving and checking. <laughs> and he's posed with his yeah, cigarette. He's, he's, yeah. he's got his swagger going on. Yeah. yeah, I look good in this, right? Right. And there's Billy Harris. I got a flag and a uniform oh, and me. I just got pinned. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's a very different vibe from these two guys. And uh, but they they made it work. They made it work. And so I think that's that's kind of a cool thing. Um, so um, the the next slide I want to show you, we, we talk sometimes about the, the fact that they're doing um, impersonation. Right. They call it special effects. So the idea is that if we're pretending to be the 75th Infantry Division, you know, bivouacking in a town, well, we better have trucks with 75th Infantry Division markings and we better have guys with 75th patches in case the Germans have left any spies. Right. Because and they did. They were there. They know we know that they did that line crossers, they called them. And so. Um, um, we talk about this a little bit in the documentary and the book, but after I made the documentary and after my co-author Elizabeth Sales and I wrote the Ghost Army book, I met a veteran named Seymour Nussenbaum. And Seymour's still alive. He's 98 years old. And Seymour was one of the guys who made the fake patches. Because right. you, you would say, well, why do they use fake patches? Why didn't they just use real patches? Uh, but they could, couldn't get them fast enough. I mean, we yeah. are talking about the U.S. Army and supply systems during a war yes, in Europe. Yes. It is not simple logistics to go. You can't just have the clerk order a thousand, you know, uh, uh, second Absolutely. division patches Absolutely. and have them be yeah. there shipped FedEx in the morning. So they made their own. And so they're made out of what are called shelter halves. So essentially it's tent canvas that's right. cut up and then hand painted using stencils and a squeegee. And that's how these are made. And Seymour estimates that they made 40,000 patches. They had about six guys, six or eight guys working in this counterfeiting gang um, that they used these 40, these the patches for both the operations they did. And then there were operations that they planned that ended up not coming off. So, um, so they made patches for those too, but he saved them. And these are really the only ones that I'm aware of. Uh, there's maybe one or two other ones out there, but these are the, uh, the real deal. And, um, and they're in his scrapbook. Now he donated his scrapbook to our nonprofit, the ghost army legacy project. And we in turn donated it to the, um, it's at the national world war II museum in new Orleans, but Seymour kept this page. He didn't donate this page. He said, well, I want it for my own presentations. I'll give it to you after I'm gone. So I'm not okay. waiting, Seymour, I'm not waiting for you to go, but I am keeping an eye on the, on the patches there. So they're, they're excellent reproductions. I, it's uh, especially the second division right there. It's uh, very detailed. I mean, yeah, look at that. And so that's all different stencils for the different colors. That's all it is. And then you, you squeegee it over. And the thing is that, that by using that technique, it also has just the slightest feel. If you were looking at it in person of dimensionality. So, you know, how like a real patch that's, you know, embroidered or whatever, whatever you call that process. I mean, it's raised a little bit, right. Yeah. And, and these have a little bit of that feel too. It's kind of a faux feel, but, but it is that way. Yeah, even, even look at them. It looks like texture, like yeah. the, the actual thread there in yeah. some of them. And so, so these guys would sew these things on their uniforms, and then, then what? Right. It just then you so off. then well well um so there I've heard different things. So so right. So you sew it on your uniform, and then you you might be an MP at a in an intersection. Uh, you might be uh, guys going, they take a truck to a water point and they're uh, filling up, uh, seemingly filling up with water for the rest of the division that's off supposedly in the woods someplace and they're wearing the patches. And then when they would uh, supposedly, uh, I heard one story that sometimes they would have two or three patches that they'd sew on over each other. And then, um, you know, they would do this all wearing one patch, take it off, and now they're doing something else wearing another patch. So you can portray multiple divisions. Don't know if that's true, but at least one of the guys claimed it was true. And, and no World War II veteran has ever lied. So we'll assume that it has to be true. Um, well, it'll and, take a lot of planning, too, to know yeah. that I need this patch on the outside. Yeah. And what if they're patch. bigger or smaller, you know? Right. So, so that seems to me a little far-fetched but but possible um and so yeah they would they would then uh, take them off and they they did not have their own uh, they were not in a they were sort of outside the normal chain of command they their unit reported directly to the 12th u.s army group so they don't have their own divisional patch so they don't they're basically uh, not wearing something between missions 
And the, one of the guys, uh, Jack Macy, one of the soldiers, told me that uh, his shirts got all wrecked from constantly sewing on and taking off patches that he had, you know, he had barely had any cloth there at all left on his shirt. Um, so that's the, you know, war's hell. And that's an, an example, a small example of that. Do you um, know if they, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, uh, no. Do, you, do you know if they impersonated any of the uh, airborne units uh, in the ETF? Um, on the cover of their official history, there is a, I believe there's an 82nd um, there is. patch. I, I'm i not sure if they actually impersonated the, the 82nd, although as discussed in the museum exhibit, um, there they did have an association with the 82nd in the week after D-Day because some of the radio operators from the Ghost Army uh, worked with the... Um, the 82nd after some of the 82nd's radios and were, were kind of MIA or damaged or whatever. Um, I do not believe that they actually impersonated the 82nd in an actual operation. Okay. I don't think so. I'd have to go back and look to be absolutely sure, but I'm 98% sure. Right. Because there were phantom airborne units. So I, I was just curious in that in that aspect. So the last slide I have before we kind of go on to more discussion it involves something that we're trying to do now. And I just want to let everybody know about this, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching us, you know, on tape, um, that we are working now to have Congress um, award this unit a Congressional Gold Medal uh, because they couldn't be honored. They weren't honored at the time. They weren't really recognized officially because of secrecy back during the war. But, um, but what they did is really extraordinary. And, uh, and I think they used creativity and imagination to save a lot of lives. And, and I think they deserve to be honored. So we have worked uh, and legislation has been introduced in the House um, and it has been introduced in past sessions in the Senate. It'll be introduced in the current session very shortly in the Senate. But in the House right now, we now have um, 274 congressmen who are co-sponsors, and we need to get to 290 for the legislation to be uh, basically to move forward. And we're very close to that. But uh, if anybody is uh, moved by this uh, and thinks they deserve to be honored, uh, you can find out more at the nonprofit website, ghostarmy.org, how to lobby uh, your representative or your senators. We ask you to reach out and try to contact them and ask them to co-sponsor the Ghost Army Gold Medal Bill, which is HR 707 in the House. And uh, we don't have a Senate bill number yet because it hasn't been introduced yet in the Senate. But I think it's a really, really worthwhile thing. And it's pretty cool, to be honest yeah. with you, that 274 uh, congressmen from both parties and from 46 or so states uh, agree, agree that this is a good idea. So that's pretty exciting. And we hope to make that happen. Well, I'll tell you what, I think while the uh, exhibit is here, that uh, you could send us a little more info on it, we could probably put a panel together. And that would be something that would be really cool to put into the exhibit. So as our as our guests come through, um, and then, you know, even our paratroopers and soldiers and uh, and all the operators that come through, and they're from places all over the country, you know, they could call and, and hopefully say, hey, if you haven't sponsored this, I'm asking you to do it now. Maybe we can get that 290. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. I think that's something we could do. Yeah. I think it's worthwhile. You know, there's, like I said, there's only 11 guys left and we want to do it while some of them are still here, you know. So um, 11 left out of 1,100 who served in the, in the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops in Northern Europe and another, I guess there were another 150 or so who served in the Sonic Company that operated separately in Italy. So um, it's, 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 it's sort of now's the time, essentially. It is. So how many uh, veterans of the, of the 23rd did you get a chance to talk to? as you're writing and you're building and putting all this together? Yeah, I would say 30 to 40 who I had substantial conversations with. There's 20 who appear, who I interviewed on camera for the documentary. Um, there's another, um, yeah, I would say 15 or, or so 
that I had substantial conversations with or exchanged letters and emails with. And then there may be another uh, 10 or 15 after that who I had, you know, sort of some brief uh, interaction with. So I probably, you know, met or interacted in some way with 50 or 60 veterans of this unit. I mean, I, I never never gone back to make a whole list and say how many it is, but it's probably something in, in that range. Well, I've enjoyed some of the um, some of the video portion of the exhibit that you put together. Um, listening to these guys talk. So uh, beyond the inflatables, what were what were the other units that were within the 23rd that helped pull this off? Right. So um, the 23rd basically has four uh, subunits, um, and uh, so um, they have a they have a sound unit. And the sound unit is the 3132nd a Signal Company Special. And their job is to, they, is to basically project sound effects from these giant speakers mounted on top of half tracks. Uh, so that if you want to make it seem like um, a convoy of trucks is coming in at night, that you can space out these half tracks and you play these sounds for people and you um, you time it so the sound seems to move along right. Um, it starts in one truck and then it fades out in that one as it's fading up on the next one and it, you might move the sound along 10 or 15 miles and make it seem like a convoy is pulling in someplace and that was incredibly uh, realistic. I think that people really believed um, uh, that sound and found it very convincing. Then you also had a radio unit, right? So as I, I talk about this, it's, it's uh, the enemy's real sophisticated. The Germans are very sophisticated in World War II about um, uh, um, basically doing traffic analysis of American radio so that they, they can't understand it's all encoded. They haven't necessarily broken the code, but they can still figure out who the messages are coming from, what size unit, where they are, and stuff like that. So you have, if you can mimic the radio operators of a real unit, then you know you can make it seem to the people who are listening in on the radio like the whole unit is there with a relatively small number of guys uh and that stuff's all done by a telegraph key right it's all morse code right. most of it is morse code and so one of the interesting things is that the ghost army operators had to learn to mimic the real radio operators so for pretending to be the fourth uh infantry division we might pull up my radio truck up next to your if you're in the fourth infantry division radio i pull up my truck next to yours i watch you for uh, uh, uh an hour or so i learn kind of what about what speed you're sending out or if there's any you know areas that anything unique to your style and then i learn to mimic that and then your truck goes off the air and my truck goes on and the thing about that is that the germans actually could identify individual american operators by their sending style so it's really important to be able to do that impersonation and it comes back to what we said early on which is attention to detail is so critical and then the um the the those are the three i always say that that's the three types of deception they went to europe with and it wasn't until they started carrying out these battlefield deceptions that they came up with that fourth type of deception, which is special effects. And, uh, and that really was an idea generated by the uh, enlisted men and the junior officers, especially a junior officer named Fred Fox. And it's again, an example, um, there's a lot of cool examples in this. You know, people have an image of the U.S. Army as a certain kind of organization. It's a top-down organization. It's an organization resistant to, you know, creative ideas. Um, it's an organization that's very bound to its rules. And the Ghost Army demonstrates that none of those things is necessarily true all the time. Because in this case, the army was open to ideas coming up from the bottom. They adopted an idea that honestly seems crazy to do this kind of deception mission. And if you're, you know, Dwight Eisenhower and you have to approve this, is this really what you want to, you know, you know, make this a priority? And he did. He made it a priority and he demanded that they be in England in time to be able to put them into action. And finally, you know, um, they... As part of special effects, they, um, this junior officer, Lieutenant Fox, Fred Fox, he said, well, we need to be able to impersonate generals. 
we need to be able to impersonate generals because if if a division is in an area there's got to be a headquarters right Right. so it comes back again what we talked about earlier you have a story right you're trying to you have a story of what you're trying to get the enemy to believe so we're trying to get the enemy to believe that they you know such and such division is near such and such town near this town of bettenberg in the in the country of luxembourg so there better be a headquarters and there better be a general who's coming in and out of that headquarters getting into his jeep with the two you know two-star license plate and driving through the towns and inspecting and so um uh, Fox said, well, we need to be able to do this. And he said, and the, and the, basically they said, well, that's against army regulations. And he said, uh, yeah, but it's like trying to, um, you know, do this impersonation without that is like trying to I- I- impersonate a woman without bosoms. Right. right? Yeah. So, uh, and they said, okay. Right. I mean, this got approved. <laughs> so again, it's, it's Here's three, some stars go out. It's three ways in which the ghost army shows you that um, that the U.S. Army in that moment, in that circumstance, can be really open to some different ways of thinking. And so that's, again, another thing I think is really exciting about the story. So those are the four kinds of deception that they did. And and although the last one, the special effects was carried out by all the parts of the ghost army, um, a lot of it was done by the combat engineering company I mentioned earlier, the 406th Combat Engineers, because they they got all the MP duty. So they were always out there guarding the intersections. Um, uh, They were probably the most combat oriented troops that they had. Uh, And so they were guarding the intersections, guarding the headquarters. So they are the people that probably were seen the most. And those were those guys uh they were the more like you said infantry based fighting trained men right. in the unit um it's good. it definitely seems like looking at uh especially in the exhibit in the book as well um there's the, the pictures of the drawings and uh, a lot of these guys are are, are are based in the artistic world you know that's their foundations and now they're thrown into the army and and um given the opportunity to take take their ideas like you just said and, and put that fourth element into it you can have 3d but if you can have 4d wow i love that right it's a fourth dimension of, <laughs> of of deception so one of the interesting things is you know when you talk about who's in this unit and we've been doing a lot of research about this lately and really trying to understand more as opposed to kind of generalizing so you have um the the unit is first of all it's put together from pre-existing army units, right? In early, late 43, early 44, December 43, January 44. They are, and and they're in a hurry. Yes. <laughs> they're in a hurry. They know so, June's coming. They know June's coming. They think it's May at that point, right? Yeah, so, you're already um, a month behind. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they are rushing to do this. So so they take pre-existing units so they kind of take who's in those units now they do some substitutions and they they leave some people behind and such but so they have a camouflage unit to do the visual deception you know the inflatables that we saw earlier um they they picked a signal company to do the signal deception there was already training this sonic deception unit was training up at what's now fort drum uh uh, at uh, what was called pine camp back then um and and so they pick these pre-existing units. So every one of them is different. So the camouflage unit has a bunch of artists in it, maybe about half, about half artists. Uh, the signal company has a number of people who had training working for Bell Telephone and working for, you know, doing, it's not just radio signals, it's also cable laying. So it's that whole thing. The Sonic company, um, they they were coming into action and they were recruiting their soldiers just as um, the army canceled its specialized training program. So they took a lot of guys, they were looking for high IQ guys from the specialized training program. And then you've got the combat engineering company and they are pretty much, you know, draftees uh, who've gone through a lot of combat training um, who are commanded by a, a, a hard ass uh, a captain, later a general, West Point uh, a guy named uh, George Reb. Uh, who's uh, passed away a couple of years ago, uh, and a, a a a small gentleman with a large personality, and um, <laughs> and so um, they uh, a really nice guy, really nice guy, yeah. but uh, but but he was tough. He was tough on them. But so you have artists, but you have farmers and bartenders and retail clerks. You have 
uh, technicians, you have actors, you have um, this, you know, this really extraordinary um, array, f f you know, everybody from from farmhands to, you know, somebody who was Helen Hayes manager in Hollywood. I mean, you have this real interesting mix of people. And um, uh, one of the guys said, I think it was Bill Blass, the, the fashion designer, became a fashion designer, right. who was in this unit, who said you, you'd hear um, uh, Beethoven's Fifth on one end of the barracks and Pistol Pack and Mama on the other end of the barracks. <laughs> So it, it really is a very interesting mix of people and, and also a, a surprising number. Well, surprising to me, you know, how many of them were either foreign born or their parents were foreign born. And sometimes we forget in my generation how recent so many families are to arriving in America. I would say a full quarter and maybe maybe closer to a third of the guys in this unit, their parents were born in other countries. You know, that 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 it's it's all pretty still fresh part of the immigrant experience. So one of the yes. things that's been really interesting is to learn, um, you know, not so much that it has anything to do particularly with the ghost army, but sort of as a cross section of American soldiers in 1944, 45 to kind of see the backgrounds of all these people. Yes. And, and a lot of those families were probably, you know, had, had lived through the First World War. Um, great migration, great immigration. Um, and so, you, you, like you said, you have this huge mix of people. Um, and it was interesting to read some of the interactions in the book with, with, with those guys, you know, talking about I had never met or I had never seen. Or I, hadn't, I didn't know that there was people from this part of the world. And, um, and, and I think it culturally, it opened them up, you it know, and, and it, it allowed them all to think almost on the same page so they could pull this, this kind of deception and, off. And which may also, you know, it's probably true of a lot of army units, right? That you, yeah. you know, people from the South meeting, you know, people from the North and going, oh, they're, they're weird uh, or, or vice versa. And right. um, um, uh, yeah, I, my my friend Jack Macy, who I mentioned, who who uh, was in the unit, he he, I love what he said, and I think it's in the film. He said, uh, "I'd only known Brooklynites and Manhattanites. I mean, that was the whole world to him was Brooklyn and Manhattan. There really wasn't anything else." And so you say, right. "Well, I mean, he's a hick from New York, right? <laughs> <laughs> right?" So uh, that's a kind of a neat a neat part of the story, and um, and some really unusual stories of people from. Uh, people from Armenia, and a lot of uh, um, Jewish refugees from Germany and Poland and Russia. Um, they're one of the one of the surviving guys of the Ghost Army was from Canada, although his family, uh, you know, emigrated. His father emigrated from Russia in 1900 uh, to wow. first to the U.S., then to Canada, then Gil, who's he's the guy who's 106. He's born in Canada, but he comes back and he's lived in the U.S. the last. 87 years um and so uh yeah it's it's that's kind of a um you know maybe i don't know if it's what people really want to hear about because they probably want to hear about the deception and stuff that they did but it's fascinating to me well uh if you uh if you're good with it let's uh let's ping abby and look at our, uh, questions and see see if anybody's got any for you and sure. um so we we do have one if you can see it on the screen uh was there a ghost army type unit in the pacific yeah so um no uh there wasn't um and this unit was supposed to go to the pacific um uh for the invasion of japan uh, if you think about a lot of battles in the Pacific, uh, it, it's real hard to do deception when you're landing on an island uh, and try to convince people that you're, I mean, you could say, well, we're trying to be at the beach over there, but there's, these are kind of relatively compact battlefields and it's hard to pull off this kind of deception. Um, but they were the, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops after they left Europe in June 1945. Um, they were they came back to the US, they had a few weeks of leave, and then they were supposed to go over and be part of the invasion of Japan. Um, and this was not something I can tell you that any of them was looking forward to. 
And, uh, you know, they'd been very lucky in Europe. They had uh, three people killed and about 25 or 30 who were seriously wounded, you know, seriously enough to have to be hospitalized or in some cases be evacuated back to the U.S. The um, they were not uh, excited about going to Japan. And so um, whatever you think about the dropping of the atomic bomb, I can tell you that these guys were all uh, very, very um, happy that that happened and that they didn't have to go be part of the um, uh, uh, the invasion of Japan. Now, that's not to say that that nobody did deception in the Pacific. And I want to be clear that I have not studied Pacific deception. And there is there is some stuff that goes on and the Navy is involved in some things and it hasn't been hasn't gotten that much attention and and I'm the wrong person to ask about it. Uh, some of it is covered. There's a tremendous book. Um, I have some issues with it, but there's a tremendously researched book called The Deceivers by Thaddeus Holt. And I know he spends a little bit of time dealing with Pacific Pacific deception in there. He wasn't a big fan of the ghost armies. That's why I'm, 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 I'm not a big fan of that part of his book, but he did do a lot of research and he had access to a lot of information. I just think he's wrong about the ghost army. I'm entitled. I can think that. You convinced me, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, and Thaddeus has passed away, so uh, he's not going to win any arguments with me. So, uh, well, yeah. feeling good about it. But, but it's interesting, and Jimmy, just because I mean, just for people who want to know this sort of thing, Thaddeus Holt was like a assistant secretary of defense or something, and in the '60s under LBJ, I think. But so he had access to a lot of information. Um, some of which was classified, some of which, parts of which I think are honestly probably are still classified. But um, he wrote this book and then he's a big fan of the British. So that's why he's a little down on the ghost army because he really loves what the Brits are doing. Right. Well, there you go. But, uh, but then he takes all of the research that he does and it's all donated to the, um, to the, the folks in Carlisle, right? At the... Uh, uh, oh, the name has just gone out of my head, but you know what Ahead. I'm talking about. Army yeah, Heritage yeah, the Education Army Heritage Center. and Education Center. And it's all on CD-ROMs there. So I actually have gone there and gone through Thaddeus Holt's research and, and found a lot of really interesting stuff. So, I mean, he really had access. And some of those discs, they even, then they didn't, some of those are not made available to the public. So there's there's still another level of stuff we don't know. But um, the information about this is scattered all around. And so it's always a great treasure hunt trying to find it all. OK. Um, it, it, it looks like that was the only question we have right. Oh, here we go. Here's another one. Oh. Are there plans for Hollywood to make a film about the ghost army? Yeah, so um, there are some, there is some effort going on in that, and it is, uh, and and that's, um, uh, uh, I see that's that's James. Um, uh, the th yes, they're trying. Um, okay. It's kind of on hiatus a little bit right now, and I'm just trying to think about what I can, uh, what I can say that. Um, you know, without violating any of my contractual agreements, because they did option uh, our book and documentary uh, at various times. Bradley Cooper has been associated with this. Ben Affleck has been associated with it. Um, you know, I'm not exactly precisely sure where things are right now. You know, we're, we're optimistic. I got to tell you that people have been trying to make a movie about okay. this for a long time you know, before I came along on the scene. And I have done some research into that, which is really fascinating. Uh, it will happen someday, whether it happens uh, someday, you know, real soon or whether it's further down the line, I guess we'll have to see. Um, I see that there's um, a, a, a question in the chat pane uh, from uh, Tricia Wyman. Do you guys see that? Oh, yep. Oh, yep. Now I do. Yep. Yeah. So um, when Tricia asks, uh, uh, did you gather any insights from the Ghost Army veterans about what they'd recommend? or advise for modern deception uh, influence and the PSYOP army forces. Um, I would say that that interaction, a little bit of that has gone on directly. So, so we, had, um, we had some of the uh, uh, PSYOPs uh, folks came down to, um, to New Orleans when we opened the exhibit that was at the World War II Museum and they interacted directly with some of the Ghost Army soldiers there. Um, I'm not sure that the, you know, that the guys who are now survivors who are in their nineties, you know, you know, have, you know, are, are 
that they have a lot of necessarily insights themselves about what the modern PSYOPs troops should be doing. But the modern PSYOPs troops are very inspired by the ghost army story. So they, they've adopted uh, some of the ghost, you know, that the ghost um, insignia they've adopted for some of their uh, morale patches and stuff like that. They study what the ghost army did. They are trying to um, learn and understand from their techniques. And as I was telling Jimmy, I've been down and talking about the ghost army to uh, the PSYOP soldiers at Fort Bragg, and I talked to another PSYOP group down in Aurora, Colorado. So there is a lot of interest there um, uh, in, in what the Ghost Army did. And I think that, you know, what, I guess I would leave it to the PSYOPs guys to say what they took from that. You know, I'm not sure that I know what they considered the most important, but they are really really interested in the story and in trying to to appreciate that. And I just want to say also that um, kind of an interesting thing. So we we're talking about research into this. Back in the right. 80s, back in the 1980s, I think it was in the 80s, late 70s or 80s, there was a Pentagon conference called the Stratagem Conference about sort of deception and that sort of thing. And there were there were a bunch of Ghost Army guys involved in that conference. Uh, Fred Fox, who I mentioned to you, uh, who right. had been a junior officer, he was involved. Billy Harris was involved. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were involved. Um, I think Bill Blass may have been involved. A bunch of other people. And those documents are still classified. I can't see them. And I don't know, I don't know that there's anything in them that's, you know, super exotic, but, but I haven't been able, I did a freedom of information request and it's, it's still pending. Uh, and I don't, um, I don't know exactly where that's going, but, uh, but it's interesting that there have been some real efforts at various times through the years and certainly ongoing now very strongly with the, with the army and the, and the psyops people being interested in what the ghost army did and trying to understand how to adapt that to, to modern day. And I, I see there that the uh, Six Psyop Battalion has adopted it for their logo. So I think that's that's awesome. Somebody sent me a, a, a patch the other day. Hang on. I'm going rogue here. So this was um, this was a a um, this is a kind of an interesting morale patch that was sent by a retired sergeant, a uh, Psyop sergeant down there in Fort Bragg. And he is really cool. He made um, a dozen or so of these. He sent them to me and then I sent them to all the soldiers, the surviving soldiers in the unit. So very um, nice. And so it's, you know, it's that modern, you know, right? So it's Velcro and it says airborne. So it's not, it's not, you know, the authentic World War II, but it's kind of the, uh, the adaptation, the modern day adaptation of it. So I think that's Wow. A really cool thing. That's awesome. Really cool. It looks like we have another one from Chris yep. Clone. Chris, yeah. Speaking of the British, was there a connection between the 23rd and the A Force? Um, not really. So, the, mm -hmm. we, well, there's a connection, but it's a little distant. So, uh, the A Force, of course, is the, the British deception efforts uh, uh, that are going on. Um, and the A Force is very involved in working on Operation Fortitude. We, Operation Fortitude is, is sometimes called the D-Day Deception, and it's it's much more well known, I think, than the Ghost Army. Although we're catching up, uh, it was the deception to fool the Germans about where the D-Day landings would take place, right. to make them think that it would take place at Pas de Calais instead of in Normandy. And so the connection is that um, the ghost army, the, the, the two officers who dreamed up the ghost army, um, Ralph Ingersoll and Billy Harris, they are coordinating the American parts of the Operation uh, Fortitude Deception with the British deception officers. So they are meeting with them. Um, in there, you know, uh, you know, having meetings at the what are now the cabinet war rooms, uh, meeting uh, Roger Hesketh and some of the other uh, people involved in uh, in British deception, uh, and they are coordinating uh, the American parts of that. 
but and they come away from that that is one of the things that is kind of uh, an inspiration for them but it's not like uh, the British Air Force is directly involved in the creation of the Ghost Army. The American Army is um, somewhat, uh, at this point, um, hasn't done a lot of deception, but wants to develop its own techniques, doesn't necessarily think that what the British are doing is exactly what we should be doing. And you can think that's a right or wrong attitude, but it was not an uncommon attitude in the early 1940s there. No, no. Um, and so, so there's just the slightest of connections, um, not a very strong one. One of the things, so people, um, that D-Day deception, people think that they used inflatable tanks in the D-Day deception, and they didn't, okay? And if you go back to the primary source documents, they didn't have any need to use inflatable tanks in the D-Day deception because there are plenty of real tanks in England, real Same American way, tanks right. at that point that you can move around pretty much anywhere you want. Um, but what's interesting is there's one exception. There's one exception to the they didn't use thing, and it's the Ghost Army. And the Ghost Army does three training exercises in May 1944. And so they do them at the Thetford Proving Ground, which is in the area where the um, Operation Fortitude planners are trying to make it seem like George Patton is building up this huge uh, army group to attack um, uh, at, uh, at Pas de Calais. So I always say that the Ghost Army is not involved in Operation Fortitude except for this one little thing. So it's always a little bit confusing because I have to say, no, they're absolutely not involved, except, except this one thing. And this one thing is probably the reason that everybody now believes that inflatable tanks were used as part of Operation Fortitude. And um, all over England, yeah, no. Well, yeah, um, but um, um, I've, I've wandered all around that answer. I think I answered the question and answered three other questions at the same time. And maybe, you know, answers that people didn't even want to know anything about. Oh, no. <laughs> Certainly they did. Well, we hope. We hope. Do you guys have any other questions out there? We we are here. There's not too many of us. I am happy. Your question can get asked if you have it. And there's no question that's that's um, that's off so, base here. I, I've got one for you, Rick. Sure. Um, so operating so close to the German lines, and um, obviously coming under fire, uh, with the uh, distinct possibility that. Um, the Germans could actually assault and attack their position, um, thinking they're a real unit. Uh, if that would have happened, what would they have done with all that equipment that they had just designed and developed and put together and brought to the battlefield? Um, how, how do you get rid of all that? Well, that's an interesting question. And, um, uh, you know, they were under orders not to let anything fall into enemy hands. Uh, how do you do that? So one of the things that uh, I was told, and I was told this by m multiple people, so I believe it to be true, is that the sound trucks, the sonic trucks, which are half tracks equipped with 500 pound speakers and, and playback equipment, they actually had explosive devices um, that they were uh, in the vehicle that so that they could, um, uh, if, if they thought they were on the verge of being captured, that they could set these off uh, and destroy the vehicle um, um, uh, before it fell into German hands. And further, I know that when they were retreating, so, so during the Battle of the Bulge, um, Ghost Army guys had a deception just on the, um, they kind of left the area 24 hours before the, the German attack at the Bulge. So they are basically, most of them are back in Luxembourg City, which is about 20, 20 miles or so from the front, but there's some concern that they might be in danger there. So the 12th US Army Group orders them to retreat all the way back to Verdun to gain, basically to get them out of the way. Wow. Um, and at that point, they did also, uh, one of the soldiers, Bernie Mason, told me that they, um, they wired some of the trucks carrying inflatables uh, with explosives as well. They were concerned that they were going to have need to have to get rid of stuff in a hurry. And so they were prepared to, to blow a lot of it up. Um, and, and it's really interesting to me that they, um, at that moment, at the Battle of the Bulge, there's a real shortage of fighting men 
in a lot of places, right? The Germans are breaking through. We are putting weapons in the hands of cooks and clerks and people like that and trying to hold it off. And here's 1,100 guys who are super mobile um, because they've got all the they've got all their own vehicles and transport that they could have chosen to throw up, you know, put up in, in Malmody or send up to Echternach or someplace and put them in the, in to hold some part of this, um, this, uh, line. And instead they don't, they pull them out, they pull them back and they send them back to Verdun. And so I have always taken that as kind of a, a strong indicator that, the leadership, uh, General Eisenhower, General Bradley, uh, at all, um, took this seriously. That this wasn't just some sort of a stunt unit that they, uh, that, oh, we're trying that, but those are the crazy deception guys, and, and we don't care. That they took that capability seriously, and they yeah. did put it into use uh, very heavily once the German advance had been kind of staunched, as then we are attacking back and counterattacking in January 1945. The Ghost armies involved in lots of deceptions in which we're trying to constantly make the Germans think we're over here when we're over here. And it's it's not something that we, it's not necessarily their sexiest deceptions, so it's not the ones I talk about all the time, but there's so many of them so quickly that it's pretty clear that it, it's playing an important role. And I would I would venture to guess that the leadership up until that point knew that there was some success. And, and rather than let that fall into hands and and lose that element um, on the battlefield. Let's pull these guys back. Let's let's keep our secret safe and um, see if we can stymie the, the push forward. So uh, it looks it looks like we have two more questions before yeah. we close out the night. Let's see here. Okay. Go to our chat. Um, Trisha has one. Yep, Tricia, do you think the innovation of World War II for deception would be possible in today's army or military um, in current bureaucratic constraints? Is there any record of women or other mi minorities serving in the ghost army or with them support roles? So um, I, the first question is one that I'm not qualified to answer. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna beg off on that. I think, I will say that I think in general, that military organizations become much more efficient in times of crisis because they have to. And so it may be, I mean, I think there's a lot of interest uh, in what the Ghost Army is doing, in, you know, a lot of interest now on the part of certain parts of the U.S. Army, but maybe that kind of innovation really needs the crisis in order for the people to be open to the innovation. But, you know, I'm not an expert. And Jimmy, you probably know more about the U.S. Army than I do, so you know you can you can have a shot at that one after me if you if you dare to go there. Um, what do you think? I, I think <laughs> I think some of the elements that what the Ghost Army did um, could be used in certain ways with the technology that we have today. I don't think um, uh, physical pieces. Oh yeah, no the phys off, you yeah. Know? I, I I I think you're looking at um um uh, you're looking into the cyber cyber warfare and you're sure. you're looking into that social media for for uh. today. Yeah, to, to, and 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 certainly there's a lot of that out there anyway. Um just that who does the regular uh the regular public. Um how often are are we Oh, did you read this? Oh, you find out 2 days later oh, that was garbage. So um but uh so but let, let me, question. Yeah, let me let me jump to the second question, which is um, uh, uh, so so the U.S. Army in in World War II, it, there's 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 no women who are in the unit or who have uh, support roles, but um, most of these inflatables are made by women uh, working in rubber factories in the United States because uh, that's who there is to make them. And I actually interviewed one of the women who made uh, inflatables. Um, uh, um, uh, Teresa Ricard, uh, who was uh, at the U.S. rubber plant in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and was 16 years old, you know, and so so women do have a role in that sense that they made the equipment that that ended up being used to carry out these deceptions, and uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind because if you the Ghost Army, like like any other part of the U.S. Army in World War II or any other 
war depends on logistics, depends on the home front, depends on the equipment that gets made for it and getting that equipment manufactured and shipped and being in theater when you need it. And and so it's not just the, the guys who are there in the front line who have an important role, it's everybody along that supply chain, right? So in that sense, yes, women were involved in making this work. Great. I think we have one more question before we close out. Okay. Um, did captured Germans ever indicate that they were fooled by the ghost army's deceptions? Yeah, so a little bit. We don't have a lot there. We have a little bit there. Um, there were, we mentioned early on in the conversation, Operation Viersen, which was their, their last uh, deception. And there were captured maps uh, from Operation Viersen uh, that showed that the enemy had uh, placed the, uh, uh, at least one division exactly where we wanted to th them to think that division was, as opposed to being in the place that it really was. There's another operation, um, Operation Brest, where interrogations of Germans after the uh, war, uh, they believed that the 6th Armored Division was on the scene um, at a time when they weren't, but the Ghost Army was there impersonating them. Um, there's a lot more research to be done on that side of things. And I think that's something that I keep hoping to find somebody who's in Germany or who is, um, you know, fluent in German and interested in, in researching this to take this on. Because, I mean, I, I don't know, it's tricky research to do because sometimes you're literally sort of saying, well, so people say, have you asked German soldiers about this? You'd literally be saying to somebody, so 75 years ago on Tuesday, did you think that was a real unit across the river from you? And nobody's memory is that specific, you know, yeah. and let, they would remember if, if they'd found out that they had in rubber tanks, right. They'd <laughs> yeah, remember right, that, right. <laughs> yeah. but they're but not going to remember, the yeah. right. They're not going to just remember if they, if they believed it and it was just another day and they believed there were some Americans over there. So it's not easy research to do, uh, but there's definitely more research to do there. And I hope it gets done. I hope so too. Um, so I, I think it's about time to wrap up, Rick. I would, uh, um, I just want to thank you so much for coming on and participating tonight and sharing all this with us. It, um, uh, it's, it, it's great. Uh, I enjoyed the book. I, I, I like the, uh, the documentary. Um, like again, and if anybody out there, it's listening tonight, um, or, and those people that may watch this down the road uh, as a recording, um, seriously, reach out, get this book. It's it's great. You're, you're what the what these men did and were asked to do was just just awesome. You know, it's inspiring. So. Well, yeah, thank you so much. It's great to have an opportunity to be here and to talk to people about it. And and you know, people can always reach out to me through ghostarmy.org if they have other questions or want to know more about it. Great, great. Um, thanks to everybody that, that showed up tonight and participated. Uh, great questions. We appreciate all that. Um, we wish you all the best, uh, all the veterans and, and any active duty members that are uh, listening in. We thank you for your service. So, uh, Rick, take care of yourself. Hope we see you at the museum soon. Hope to get uh, there. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Jimmy.